I'm Tom Hewkins, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about Contrarian Pearl. Um, day to day, I work with lots of different companies in and around London doing pearly stuff. So I hope that what I'm going to talk about is based on like, actual knowledge and not just be me making things up. But of course, there is going to be a fair amount of me making things up as well. Now, what do I mean by contrarian? Well, you could go and look in the dictionary, and of course, that will have a very clear definition of what this word means. But I think it'd be quite fun to disagree with that, though. I mean, <laughs> obvious joke. But So I, I, let's go into a bit more detail. To describe what I'm thinking of before I talk about contrarian pearl, I want to kind of get into the idea of what I'm thinking of by the word contrarian. So to demonstrate that, I want to show you this badly drawn graph with unlabeled axes. Um, and to label the axes, I think lots of things in life follow this sort of pattern. That if we're looking at the quality on the bottom, going from left to right, low quality on the left, high quality on the right, and the frequency of things. We see lots of things in the world that are kind of pretty good, you know, not too bad, okay. And we see a small number of things that are really good and a small number of things that are really bad. Now, often we talk about industry standards and thinking about what an industry standard is. Well, that's a thing that's commonly done, right? So this is kind of the stuff that's in the middle, the stuff that's not too good, not too bad, but really common. Um, and of course, the thing isn't really, you know, sometimes people will say, this is a standard. But it isn't really a standard if no one's doing it. So I think when we talk about industry standards, it has to be something that's some, that people really are doing, not just something someone says is a standard. And another term I'd like us to consider is best practice. Now, when we talk about best practice, what's that? Well, that's the best bit, right? That's the really high quality stuff. But best practice is really rare because, like, it's, you know, it's the best. <laughs> if, 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 if best practice were really common, then it would just be average, and it isn't. So what amuses me is when people talk to me about the industry standard best practice, or perhaps they ask me a question, like I'll say, oh, we're going to solve this problem, in, and, we go, and they say, okay, what's the industry standard best practice for solving this problem? It doesn't exist, does it? But there's another bit. There's another thing I haven't explored. And what's this? Well, this is where you don't want to be, right? This, this means not only are you doing badly, but you're doing way worse than like, any, anyone else. But let's come back to the idea of an industry standard. What the industry standard gives us safety. It gives us things to follow, things to fit in with, to know that we're doing OK. And if we choose to be contrarian, then we're going to end up in one of these two places. But which one? You probably don't get to choose in advance. You probably just go to try to do something different, and you end up in one of these two places. So the important thing, whether you're being contrarian or not, I think is to give yourself free feedback, to seek feedback from others, to check if you are on the left-hand side of this and you think you're on the right-hand side, try and find out as early as possible. <coughs> There's no harm in doing badly because it's inevitable. But make sure that when you are doing badly, you can find out about it and avoid it. So that's kind of ideas of contrarian and whether contrarian can be good or bad or just a thing, just neutral. Now, in Pearl some years ago, we had standard ways of doing Pearl. And they were starting to look a bit old-fashioned because people had come up with newer ways of doing Pearl. So they called them modern Pearl. And lots of us started following modern Pearl in our work and doing that sort of stuff. And that was, I guess, I've lost track of time, but was it 10 years ago? Something like that. So if we all know what modern Pearl is, and we all have a rough idea for what that is, what's contrarian Pearl? Well, I would argue that when modern Pearl started, it was contrarian, because it, it was doing things in a way that hadn't been done before. But then lots of people started saying, oh, this looks pretty neat. I'm going to do that too. And so perhaps modern Pearl became the industry standard, and it became normal. So now when I'm thinking about contrarian Pearl, I'm aiming to be in that quality the high quality section of my graph, but I risk being in the low quality section of my graph. But I have some ideas about what I think contrarian pearl might be and what these ideas might feed into, how these ideas might feed into modern pearl, because modern pearl isn't meant to be a fixed thing. It's meant to be something that adapts and fits in with the world over time. Pearl has lots of popular web frameworks, and this is good because there's more than one way to do it. And these web frameworks are a lot better a lot of the time 
than reinventing things from scratch. But one of the things I found with web frameworks is, or anything that's a framework, is it prevents you a structure that you fit your code inside. It doesn't, it doesn't take a different approach, which I'll come to in a moment, but the web framework basically says, well, you're creating a web application, so you're going to need this, this, and the other, this and that, and you put things together within your framework. And when you kind of want to extend that framework, you typically have things called plugin. So let's imagine I'd invented my web framework, which I'm going to call Bike Shed. And I've decided, here's how you write web apps, and if you want to extend it, you write Bike Shed plugins. And then someone else comes along, and they've decided, well, uh, that's not a bad web framework, but I'm going to write my own one, because, you know, I can do that. And so they have Unicycle Shed plugins, and that's, we've now got these two different um, ecosystems within our programming language, both of which have plugins. And, well, perhaps there's some duplicated work here. Perhaps if, if, your plug, if your two plugins in your two different ecosystems, both written in Perl, are doing the same thing, I mean, there's no harm in that. But it's a bit of a shame. Wouldn't it be nice if we could abstract that out and we had some kind of place for putting all of these common libraries where we store reusable code that can be reused between different frameworks? And yeah, we, we have CPAN. Um, so where am I going with this? Well, a lot of the time what you don't want is something that, that kind of fits within a structure. You want to pick lots of small independent separate modules and tie, t tie them together. So let's say I'm building a, a website and it needs to have some kind of authentication system, some kind of database access, something for uh, sending data out. Perhaps it's to a modern web front end thing, or perhaps you still render your web pages on the server side. Well, there are CPAN modules to do all of these. And I keep playing with the idea of not using a web framework, but of putting small amounts of code on top of PSGI. And for those of you who don't know, PSGI, we tend to think of it as a low-level thing that web frameworks are built on top of. But you can also use it just to, to build a very simple web application like this, which just tells me what URL I've re requested. It's not very interesting. But the point about PSGI is that with these this, this small application, you can basically tie together the different Perl code that you have. And there are common PSGI middlewares. And middlewares sit around the outside of your application. So let's say um, the authentication system that you have isn't tightly coupled to your application. You can have a middleware that, that checks people's usernames and passwords and sets a variable that's passed into the inner layers of the middleware. Now, when I talk about this, not using a framework, a lot of people I talk to say, oh, but isn't this what we were doing in the past, and this was really bad, so we all started using frameworks. And yeah, I mean, what, what we need to be careful to do is to not go back to the old days of, of huge thousand line long subroutines. Um, and one way I found useful for doing this is to take the idea of a router that I embed in my PSGI ap application. And I don't mean the thing that I log into and give a Wi-Fi password. I'll, you know, not a physical router that sits in your living room, but one of these. Something that just maps URL endpoints to subroutines that are called based on that. Um, I was nosing around on CPAN for a toy project I was writing in my spare time and happened to find this router boom thing, which is quite neat because your URL endpoints are basically uh, kind of URI template-like things. So it's just so the second line there will find any search query and will send that query as an argument to my dispatch search subroutine. So by looking at all these small independent pieces and tying them together in an application, I, I think I like doing that more than using web frameworks at the moment. Maybe, maybe I'll change my mind. So, we've, I guess we've all used Perl for data processing. Like that, that's one of the things it's still really good at and one of the things it started being known for. And so, uh, you know, you often find yourself writing quick scripts to convert from one format to another. And a while ago, I found this module just poking around on CPAN that makes this even easier because it contains um, emit processors and emitters for various different commonly used file formats. And so it can do a lot of the work for you. Uh, most importantly, it not only contains these things, but they operate in what's, what I'm going to call a streaming mode. So if you think about loading a huge HTML document and processing that with something like DOM, all of that document gets loaded into RAM. 
And if you've got a ginormous XML document that you want to process and it won't fit in RAM, you want to use something called a streaming parser that takes that document in chunks. And the good thing about Kathmandu is it operates with a whole load of different data formats to take that chunked-based approach. And it has a command line. That so Kathmandu is a collection of Perl modules, but you if you don't want to even write a Perl script, you can just use them from the command line. You can say what format you want and for your input and output. This example here is processing uh, British food hygiene ratings that every local council emits. So basically, I, I just threw this together. They, they store their data in XML. I wanted to get it out as CSV. If you wanted to put it in a relational database, it would be just as easy to do as this. Um, so the establishment detail and the names of the XML nodes, the, sorry, the elements that I'm matching on. And the last line, this fix collapse set, what that's telling me is that Within my XML, I've got some nested structures. And if I didn't have that there, my CSV would contain that horrid 0x hash thing that we all see in Perl when we're outputting a complicated data structure as a string. So that basically, I can do little, one li little uh, parameters like this to reprocess the data. There's a whole load of fixes, converters, and whatnot. And also, you can just write tiny little bits of Perl in this. So you, you, there is a fix, which is, I'm just going to write some Perl now. So this makes what was easy in Perl, data processing, data conversion, even easier. And when I discovered this, I kind of kicked myself because I'd spent quite a lot of time over the previous two years writing various XML importing tools that I wished I hadn't written and this thing would have saved me from writing. But hey, never mind. Maybe next time. Search indexes are a thing that we put into lots of our applications because, oh, we have lots of data nowadays, right? And it's hard to manage. And um, like librarians said that we go around and catalog everything. And Google said, no, we have software. And you build a big search index. And Google won and the librarians didn't. And when nowadays in our Perl applications, when we're um, putting search into our application, the common thing to do is to use something like Elasticsearch or um, what's the other one, Solar. And these things sit on top of a low-level Java library called Lucene. These things work. They're really easy to get on with. Um, I kind of put the logo on here because a lot of people say that Perl 6 is really bad because it has such an unprofessional logo. And um, this is a tooth with some arms. So, you know, <laughs> there you go. Um, but if you, there's, and of course, the great thing, I've, like, what I love about Elasticsearch is I don't need to think. I just throw data at it and it just works. But I was messing with um, a small data set at work of 8.5 million customer addresses, all of which have been anonymized, which is good. Because, um, yeah, GDPR is a thing nowadays. And I took all these 8.5 million uh, customer addresses, used this Perl module, which actually wraps some C libraries, um, got all the, it took me about 20 minutes to index these on my low quality laptop. So basically, it's pretty fast. And the searching was lightly, lightning fast. And the amount of storage it used was considerably less than the RAM on my mobile phone. So what I like about this solution is it's really low resource usage. Um, it can scale up. There's a lot you can do with Lucy. It's very low level, like um, Java's Lucene. I've, I've mentioned here it's Apache Lucy. It was until a couple of months ago one of, um, one of the projects under the Apache umbrella. But now it isn't for some reason. I, I don't know why. But if you don't want a low level search library, and you want something that indexes documents and does all sorts of clever and fancy stuff, there's another module on CPAN that sits around the outside of Lucy. I haven't used this one yet because, um, yeah, I haven't got around to it, but it looks really cool. A lot of places I've worked when we do web integration testing with Perl will write mechanized scripts or things like that. Um, and that, that's a good way of doing web integration testing with Perl. But past few years, I've been using a standardized protocol called WebDriver. I gave a talk about this at Glasgow at the Perl conference, in case anyone's interested, the talk's online. There are several Perl modules that, that wrap WebDriver. And earlier today, there was a talk about using Cucumber, behavior-driven development, that can sit around WebDriver and basically allow people to write natural language test cases. Now, sometimes people say to me that Perl is a scary language because it's really ambiguous. So I'm a bit puzzled why people are writing their test cases in English. But lots of people who, lots of people I know who, who do like software testing for a living use BDD, and they tell me it's really great. So I kind of trust them, but I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't know. 
But of course, the great thing about WebDriver and the great thing about the libraries on CPAN that do this is that if you are skeptical about writing your test cases in English, you can build other extensions around WebDriver because these are just CPAN modules. So let's, let's see what we all do with it. Let's keep trying new ideas. Perl has um, very well known, very good uh, database abstraction layers, and I'm not going to talk too much about those. But I'm going to talk about a thing I've seen in any application that is more than a little while old. And I'm being fairly, fairly ambiguous there. What, what, you, what I tend to see in applications is a bit like someone writing a shopping list, then going to the supermarket and coming home. And that's great, because they've now bought the first item on their shopping list. So they go back to the supermarket, buy the second item on their shopping list. In reality, when you go to the supermarket, you probably try to buy all the things on your shopping list and come home. But what I see in large applications is because um, the, da the powerful database modules we use in Perl give us so much uh, convenience, we often don't realize when we're sending queries to the database and how many queries we're sending to the database. So I think it's really helpful to put your data storage and retrieval code in its own compartment, in its own uh, concern of your code base. And I was talking earlier about web frameworks, and of course one of the things that they often make a fuss about is the idea of MVC. And the problem with MVC in my mind is that you're basically saying my application has three parts or something like that. But to me, thinking about the different bits and very much ring fencing data storage and retrieval is helpful. And it's especially helpful if, you're, if to start with, you decide to use your relational database for search queries because it's easy to get started. But later on, you want to move over to a fully fledged search system by encapsulating your database access. You can make that easier. And another problem you can have with your database um, interaction code is that you've, you write a very small unit of code and you, you, you're interacting with the database there. But then you, then you want to unit test it. And now to, to run a small unit test against a small piece of code, you have to load, run a full database. And that database has to be in exactly the right state. And if it's not in the right state, your test fails. And your unit test is now, now most of the time spending most of its work, and mostly when it fails, failing not because of your code, but because of stuff around the database. And that can be really annoying. So dependency injection is the idea of not so not connecting to the database and fetching things, but perhaps having a code ref that puts the values in there for you. Um, I, I, yeah, it's, I'm kind of being a bit vague on this because there's a whole load of detail on it, but I'm trying to plant the idea in people's heads rather than explaining it well. Is that a reasonable excuse? Um, and finally, API calls. Just as we talk to databases a lot, you know, th there's a trend for microservices, and of course, even before that trend started, Services online call other services. This is a thing that happens. And increasingly, we're moving to HTTP as our way for talking to other services. And there are lots of CPAN modules for calling web services. So you find you, you, your application needs to call service X, Y, and Z. So you download the CPAN modules for talking to service X, Y, and Z. The problem with these a lot of the time is that they go and create their own HTTP user agent objects, sorry, LWP user agent objects, or perhaps um, HTTP client or whatever library they happen to be using. And they keep them to themselves. So now you've, you've got a whole load of duplication of work. So earlier I was saying that, these, that CPAN modules are great because they um, exist and they provide reusable code but sometimes they don't play nicely with each other. It's, um, you can easily find each web service client creating its own user agent, and before you know it, your large application has user agent objects scattered all over the place. So this is a, a good example where dependency injection can help. But of course, some of these ideas are going to be good, some of them are going to be bad, some of them I've done, I've pointed at a search system that I've never even used, so it might be abysmal for all I know. But what I want to do is when people say, what is the best practice, or oh, what does modern Perl say, I want us to bear that in mind. But also to look at the other things that we see, the other things that we might want to try. And not to be contrarian is in objectionable, because that might lead us to be in that bottom left, low quality area. But to explore the things that can lead us towards the high quality area, and perhaps to improve what our average is over time. Thank you for listening.
Okay. Um, Go for it. Ooh. So yeah, the question is, I've been talking about contrarian pearl, and the question is, what can we apply to environments? Now, at first I thought you meant, say, working environments, but you mean infrastructure? Infrastructure. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I miss, can I answer the question I heard and not the question you asked? <laughs> so so I, uh, firstly, I'm told that communication is really important, but, you know, let's not bother with that. Um, so, I mean, yeah, what, coming back to the whole <coughs> agile thing, of course, the, the, the point of Agile is that you have repeated feedback and that you're always, you know, is this good, is this good? And the idea that you're, you're always assessing what you have. So you have the daily stand-ups, you have retrospectives. Um, I think what can be useful in anything if you are trying to be contrarian is that, well, look, are we in the good quality or the, high qu or the bad quality bit? So, I mean, are you kind of thinking of, are, you, are we leading towards systems monitoring, stuff like this? Okay. Yeah. yeah, so what Catherine's saying is the, the kind of the key point is ask the question of yourself and I think also invite others to ask questions and, and um, I, I was, I, was I, I have some lovely colleagues and I was complaining at one of them in the pub the other day and, and he said to me, yes Tom, he said, he's a really nice guy and he said, yes, you're, you're very good at spotting problems and I thought, oh that's nice <laughs> and then I thought, oh wait, there's another bit I'm supposed to do. So, so this guy really gently broke it to me. He's like, yeah, there's some areas of your work you need to do a bit better at. Um, uh, any more questions before I make it all about me? Okay, you're not allowed coffee, but enjoy the, the next talks. <laughs>